So what's your name? I was born Juan Eduardo Valenzuela Sandoval. <laughs> That's a bit long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm known better online as Auburn. And what do you do? For the last eight years, I've been working on a hypothesis about the human mind-body connection. And I say hypothesis because as of April 2020, uh, there hasn't been any scientific publications yet. But the goal is to publish papers eventually, although right now the model is in an experimental phase. And what is this hypothesis? The hypothesis can be summed up in three statements. First, that humanity is biologically divided into different cognitive processing styles. That these processing styles have a limited number of sets in which they combine. And most importantly, that these processing styles produce effects on the person's face and body, which can be backtraced to deduce their underlying processing style. What do you mean by different cognitive processing styles? To explain cognitive processing styles, it helps to use a computer as a metaphor. Now, the human mind is not exactly like a computer, but the metaphor is close enough to work. So now let's say that you had uh, two different devices. You have an Android device and an iOS device. And they're both using two different softwares, but they're both accomplishing the same tasks. So for example, they can provide audio and visual output as well as tactile feedback and they can both be used to browse the internet and basically do all the same functions. And you can imagine the human mind being the same way where there are multiple possible solutions in how we process information in order to achieve the same tasks, but through different uh, computational paths. In evolution, if there are two ways to do something and both of them work, then both of them can be selected for. And that's what's responsible for all the diversity in the animal kingdom. Now my argument is that that also applies within humanity where the 7 billion people on earth don't all use the same solutions, the same brain software as it were, in order to accomplish the same tasks. How many brain softwares are there? Well first I have to say that I don't know the absolute number and that's because of a phenomenon known as neurodiversity which says that individuals can vary on a case-by-case -case basis so if you imagine, for example, somebody having a slight change in their genome, which causes them to have some idiosyncrasies in their sensory processing, that's neurodiversity. And we can't account for how many those are because there are as many little changes as there are subtle mutations in people. But the brain differences that I focus on are not those uh, little idiosyncrasies within neurodiversity. The differences I focus on are on canonical programs, as it were, that exist within the human psyche uh, that differ from people to people and there are four of them and we can give these four programs names they could be anything but i like to use the letters m v eda and ale now the hypothesis suggests that if somebody has m they don't have v and if somebody has eda they don't have ale and vice versa uh, we don't know why this is, but so far the data suggests a very strong exclusivity between one process and the other. And one suggestion for why this might be is that they're both opposite ways of processing the same information, and the psyche can only do it in one of those ways. And so, for example, you either have an Android or an iOS operating system running, but not both at the same time. And there seems to be a genetic component at work as well, because so far all the identical twins that we've looked at have all shared the same cognitive processing style. And that push towards exclusivity leads to an emergent typological situation. So you could think of this the same way that we look at blood types, where according to the ABO system, there are eight blood types because there are four blood groupings, A, B, A, B, or O, which can either have a positive or negative H factor. And so mathematically, there are eight outcomes. Similarly, since each person has either M or V, and either ALE or EDA, that creates four possible combinations. Each one of these combinations has a complete set. In other words, each one accounts for all of the same cognitive processing aspects within a person. We call these four cognitive combinations alpha, beta, gamma, or delta, and we each belong to one of these sets.
just as we each have a blood type. These four cognitive groupings are all redundant versions of the same thing, so each one can perform all the same operations that the other can, but from a different metabolic route. And this creates four different families or groupings of humanity. However, I should emphasize that these processes aren't the entirety of the brain. The majority of the brain is still shared between most people. And as we see in the Human Connectome Project, there are hundreds of smaller cognitive processes that the brain handles. But this cognitive typology, as it were, describes canonical variants in a few of those cognitive processes, but not the whole brain. But that's why this model is called cognitive typology. And how do we know this is the case? Well, the short answer is that we don't know yet, at least not officially. What I'm describing is a hypothesis that so far fits the data. If the existence of these canonical cognitive divisions is true, then we would expect to see evidence of it in genetics, in brain activity, but also in body movements. When people think of cognition, they often think about the brain and brain waves and brain activity, but that's actually not the only line of evidence that we have for cognition. The theory of embodied cognition advanced by people like George Lakoff and Francisco Varela go against this sort of Cartesian dualism of mind and body and say that the brain and body are not only inseparable, but that they can't even be conceptualized separately. To even think of the mind without the body makes no sense because the purpose of the mind is to be a bidirectional computer for sensory motor inputs and outputs. We're presented with an environment and if we move towards it in appropriate ways, we survive. Whatever neurological variations exist in us that allow us to do that, to move in the environment successfully, get hard-coded into us. And so not only is there a tight feedback loop between the mind and the body, but the mind is created and programmed according to the inputs and outputs necessary in the environment. In fact, the purpose of cognition is to regulate motion. It is to take in sensory motor stimuli and to execute uh, behaviors accordingly. Therefore, and this is key, you can play this out in reverse and you can discern the nature of an organism's brain software by looking at how it is embodied in motion. And there's no easier place to demonstrate this than by looking at animals. Take a cat, for example. If you observe a cat, it has canonical motions it executes. It'll lick its fur, it'll squint its eyes very slowly, it'll raise the hairs on its back in a defensive manner. Now if we observe a dog, the movement profile is very different. From the way it walks to the way it barks, the voltology is distinct and separate from a cat because it has a different cognition, a different software. It behaves like a dog because it is a dog. So now here's an experiment you could run. If you took a cat and a dog of identical dimensions, because some dogs are the size of cats, and you put motion trackers on them, and you removed all the footage, and you just observed the motion trackers, would you be able to identify which one is the cat and which one is the dog? Uh, the answer is yes, quite easily. You could tell which is which, and not because you saw the cat or the dog themselves in the footage, but because you recognize the kind of cognition which would give rise to this kind of behavior. And so when you look at that footage, you say, this is a dog brain. And when you look at this footage, you say, this is a cat brain. This is embodied cognition. And it's another objective avenue to measure the mind outside of brain activity. Now, in an age where we still have so much to learn about the human mind, I find the investigation of embodied cognition to be so essential as a means to gain an understanding of our brain and our psychology. If the principle of embodied cognition is accepted and we realize that our own nervous systems evolved the same way as everything else in the animal kingdom, then we simply cannot ignore our own embodied expression in our understanding of our own cognition. I would argue that we cannot solve the problem of human consciousness and understand it properly without doing so by also taking the outside in perspective and tracking what kind of motion vectors humanity produces. So then we study the embodied expressions of humanity in order to gain insight into what the nature of our cognition really is. If we understand that no human movement is truly random, but that each movement is in some ways a neurological effect, then we can work backwards from embodied expressions to get to cognition 
and this is the field of voltology. Voltology is the study of embodied expressions as evidence of cognition. So how do we know that humanity is subdivided cognitively? What's the proof? We know that humanity is subdivided into different cognitive processing styles for the same reason we can tell apart a cat and a dog's cognition by their embodied expression. Because humans also don't all express the same motion vectors. And there are canonical motion vector groupings, complete sets of them, with different expressions within humanity. And these canonical motion vector groupings always correspond to a given cognition and a psychology. The natural conclusion that I come to from there is to hypothesize that humanity as a species contains complete but different cognitive variants.